chapter that I was reading Exodus chapter 33, and I went back and read it a few times. It was a real blessing to me. And I, I saw in there how important, and we all know this, but how important God's presence is. And really, without the presence of God, where would we be? And we think about God was ready to withdraw himself at this time. In the Old Testament, in this chapter, God was ready to withdraw himself from the children of Israel because of their sin with the golden calf. God was thinking about it. He said, I haven't decided, basically, what I'm going to do yet. But I'm really thinking of pulling out. And the state of the people, they didn't know what to do. And really, if God said that to us, I'm thinking of pulling out. What would we do? What would we do? Like Jesus said to Peter and to the disciples, will you also go away? Are you going to leave? What was Peter's reply? To whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Who are we going to go to? If God just decided to pull out, where would we be? But when you think about that, you say, wow, where would I be? Does God have a right to do that? Do we give him just cause? How important today is God to you? How important is he? When you say he's important, how important? More important than your job? More important than your house? More important than your family? More important than your husband? More important than your wife? Where does God rank? I remember my sister, Kelly. There was a poll taken by the teacher. Name the top 10 things in your life. This was back when she was either in ele late elementary school, middle school, somewhere in there. And most of the kids, one through 10, most important things in your life. Most of them put down number one as mom and dad, family. And some of them on their list, she remembers it because everybody kind of shared what they felt. And I remember this because she was devastated. She was devastated that there were a couple in her school at that time that God did not make the top 10. And it devastated her. She was come home and just couldn't believe it. And I remember it because she had said it over and over again at the house that night. Now, on some of their lists, God was number one. On some of the others, God was non-existent. If we gave each of you a list of the 10 most important people or things, where would God rank? You say, well, I'd put God number one. But where would you want to put him? And really, if you be honest, where would he be? Where would he be? Be honest with yourself today. Because listen, you can fool me. And I can fool you. <laughs> but we can't fool God. Where does God belong? Come on. Where does he belong? What's he based that on? He based it on his first commandment, right? And Christ upheld that commandment. To love the Lord thy God. He said the first commandment, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Think about this. And we were talking about, and, and my messages lately have been about Genesis and the law and everything, getting 10 commandments. Wednesday, I talked about, if you were here Wednesday, and I know somebody got a blessing because it got posted to YouTube and they felt it was a good message. And I praise the Lord. He gave it to me that we all, you know, learned on Wednesday that God didn't just give Moses the Ten Commandments, that God came down on the mountain, had everybody around it. And at one and one fell swoop and one thing he gave, he gave those commandments to all of the nation of Israel at one time. And he spoke in that cloud. When he gave those commandments, he gave them to all the people at one time. 
So all the people heard the words of the Lord, saw his glory, and got the Ten Commandments. Now, the irony of it is that soon after they got these Ten Commandments, what did they do? And this was where, after we were talking, some of the men, and Phil in particular, he says, it's just amazing to me, Pastor. It's amazing. And we had a really good talk afterwards. There were four or five men that were up here talking. And he said, I, I, I just almost can't believe they could get these Ten Commandments and see the glory of God and feel the earth quaking and hear the thunder and all the power and majesty of God and get these Ten Commandments spoken to them audibly by God. And within a couple chapters, they were making a golden calf. How is that possible? Think about our lives. Has God done great things for us? Sometimes we find ourselves drifting so far away from God that we couldn't find him with a laser beam. I told you yesterday when I was preparing this sermon, and maybe God did it to me just to teach me something. I don't know. And I praise God for his lessons, whether they be positive or negative. And every one of us should. Because I'll tell you what, even when it's a negative lesson by God, I like it because I know God's still there. Amen. And I know he loves me because he chastens me. Hebrews, Hebrews tells us specifically, whom the Lord loveth, loveth, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye be without chastisement, what are you? It's a bad word to the world. But the Bible says this word, if you be without chastisement, if God's never dealt with you about anything, he's never, you do wrong and God never intervenes and challenges you on it or deals with you about it or negatively does something that you know it was God. If you don't have that in your life, the Bible says you're a bastard and not a son. In a pretense, you think you are. You think you're his child but you've never become one of his children. You're not one of his. God will chasten those that are his. God will go after those that are his. When you have a disobedience in your life or you have sin in your life and things that you have given more attention to over God, that upsets the Lord because one of the names of God is jealous. Jealous. You say, well, it's not right to be jealous. Envy's that problem and malice, but jealousy is a different thing. You can be jealous to a good thing. And it's a capital J. So when you think of the word jealous, like wisdom personified is God. Jealousy, jealous. God is jealous in a righteous manner. God wants our attention and God wants us to focus on him. And when we do, and it's not that he's sitting there saying, I have to have because I'm me. That's not the way God is. God wants the attention because he poured out his love to us. And all he wants in return is just serve me. Live for me. Give me what? Your heart. Your heart. And today I'm afraid there are a lot of people who have calloused, cold, in different hearts. And just won't, they just won't give it to God. God wants a soft, pliable heart. You know, like when I was in school, they'd give us a piece of piece of uh, metal. And you could either bend that piece of metal. And if you ever had a piece of lead in your hand, just realize lead just, it folds, you can crumple, you can do whatever you want with that piece of lead. It's pliable, it's flexible. It could be molded in shape like a piece of pottery, a piece of clay. Mold that. That's what God wants. He wants to be able to mold our heart. He wants to be able to mold and shape us. But we should really always desire to be in the presence of God. And when we're not, it should really upset us. God could be distant. And yesterday, again, as I was preparing, it took me a while to feel that the presence of God, that I was in his presence. I don't know what it was, but there was just a cloud over over and I was having a hard time. I said, Lord, I don't feel you here right now with me. I don't feel 
any direction. I don't feel any guidance. I don't feel you leading me in any direction. And it bothered me. I want to get up here and I want to know that God gave me what I needed to tell you. I don't want this to come from me. I want it to come from God. And I want you to get what God needs you to have today. And sermons aren't always, a, they, I guess they are a one size fits all. But some sermons, some people just need that particular thing for that particular day. And maybe somebody in here today needs this. I don't know. But in this case, when we go to Exodus chapter 33, we're going to have a word of prayer here. I just want to tell you that Exodus chapter 33 comes on the heels of that giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, and those people being blessed by the Lord. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, pray that you bless this message. I pray that you lead me and guide me, Lord, into all truths this morning. Help me, Lord, to open up thy word and bring it forth to the people the way you'd have me to do it. And Lord, if there are needs today, I pray you would fill those needs. And I pray for the Rigger family, pray for comfort for them. I pray that you'd help them in their, uh, in their time of need today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's go to Exodus, Exodus chapter 19. Now, in, in chronological order, Exodus 19 falls before Exodus 33. So Exodus 19, Exodus 19, and look in verse 16. We'll just read three verses here. Exodus 19 and Exodus 20 is when the commandments were given, the Ten Commandments. Exodus 19, verse 16, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. Now, for those that, that think, and again, I went over and expounded on this Wednesday night, Moses wasn't the only one to get the commandments from an audible voice. The people got them. Okay, so the whole mount was on a smoke. And all of them came to the point of the mountain where they could go no further. And the Lord said, don't go any further than these boundaries. If anybody touches anything beyond this, whether it be a foot, a hand, whatever, a beast, they're to be killed. They could only go so far. The glory of God came down. The commandments were given. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. It says in 19, and God in the end, and God answered him by a voice. Okay. So answered Moses, but he spoke to all the people. And again, if you want to hear more about that message, that was Wednesday. I expounded upon all of that. So the people get it in Exodus 19 and 20. They get the Ten Commandments. God speaks to all of them. Now we get up to chapter 32, and something happens up here in chapter 32. They sin greatly against God. Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32. Exodus 32. And just, just to go real quickly through to let you know, this is when the golden cap is made. Verse 1, they tell Aaron, up, make us gods. Okay. And Aaron, in verse 2, Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And then the people do that in verse 3. Verse 4, And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a cap, molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, this isn't very long after the mountain was on a smoke, and everything's trembling. Everybody's trembling and quaking, and the voice of God is given the Ten Commandments, and God says, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt, and then thou shalt, and he goes through all ten, and all the people answer and say to Moses, all that God hath said, we will do. And Moses goes up for 40 days and 40 nights, and while he's up there, the people say to Aaron, up, make us gods. And what really, really ticks God off the most and Moses is they make a golden calf because that calf was worshipped in Egypt and those people knew those Egyptians worshipped that, that calf and the cow. 
They worshiped it. And don't go figure here, the devil puts it in their heart to make a molten God. And as Aaron said, when Moses said, what did the people to you that you made these gods? What did they do to you? What did they press upon you to make something like this? And Aaron said, they gave me their gold, their earrings, they broke them off, and I put it all into the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> like, poof. There it was, Moses, and it was a calf, and it was gold, and Aaron had no backbone, did he? Aaron was the priest, wasn't he? And to his sons, God gave the priesthood. But it goes to show you that no matter how a person, if you're not a good leader, you're not a good leader. And Aaron didn't have that in him to do it. He didn't have that in him to tell the people, no, this is wrong. Aaron did it. And when Moses comes down, Moses is grieved. And Aaron, and, and, and he chides with Aaron, and God is grieved. And because of this, Moses intercedes. And if it weren't for Moses, what a mess it would have been for the people. So you think about this presence of God. How important is the presence of God in your life today? How important is it? You wake up every morning, you open your eyes, and you thank God. Thank you, Lord, for another day. Is that right to do? You brush your teeth, you get dressed, you walk out the door. Lord, guide my steps today. Me and you, help me today. Lead me and guide me. Do it your whole life. And when you're young, especially, as I preached last week, so many of us have decisions to make in life. We have to make these decisions. What do we base them on? Some of you in here are thinking about going to school somewhere. Are you consulting the Lord for your decision? How important it is. God, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What does God want from you? Oh, to be in the presence of God. But to have God withdraw that presence and feeling of God's not there for me? Boy, what a mess you'll make of your life. Exodus chapter 32. Now let's stay here. Let's go into verse 30. Now this is after they made the calf and after Moses comes down. It says, and it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and there's this dash. Everybody have a dash? You have a dash. There's a thought there. If thou wilt forgive their sin, there's a pause. Moses wanted God to forgive their sin so badly that he did a Paul moment. He could wish himself accursed for his people. And he told the Lord, if you won't forgive their sin, please forgive it. And if not, blot my name out. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. He was such a leader that he would have died and been damned because he wanted to see God forgive the people and God's presence stay with the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Now he sends his angel, but the Lord says, lead the people. And this really doesn't sit well with, with Moses. Moses knows that God here is thinking about getting off and jumping, jumping off. He's thinking about, I'm not going to lead the people and I'm not going to stay in the midst of the people. God hasn't decided what he's going to do. He's very upset over this golden calf. And we think about our lives. Have we ever made a golden calf in our heart? And today, what might that golden calf be? Have we ever done it? And have we ever made the Lord so upset where God's dealing with us? And we know, we know it's there, and God knows it's there. 
but yet for some reason we hang on to it. And the Lord plagues us over it. And he deals with us over it. Now, a wise person would say, I got to get rid of this. A foolish person keeps it there. Again, the Bible was written for our admonition and our learning. We can see all this stuff. And I tell you, many times we read it and we go, oh, those people, look what they did. And the Lord whispers and says, you're doing the same thing. It has a negative effect. When the presence of God is withdrawn. Now you say, but he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I know, amen, Ben, it's one of your favorite verses. And I always think about him when I read it. Because I always get a good amen and a, sh and a head shake, a nod, when I mention that verse. And it's a great one. And praise God, he'll never leave us. But can he withdraw a little bit of his presence from us? You want to go on your own? Go. That's a dangerous, dangerous place to be. A terrible, terrible place. Look, it goes back to the beginning. And I know I've been talking about this law of first mention in Genesis, but let's think about this. When Adam and Eve committed the sin, after they sinned, what did they do? What did they do? For one, they covered themselves. They said, something happened with, you're naked. And what? Hey, you don't have any clothes on. What? I was good before. You're not now. Something went off. I got to get covered. And then, uh-oh. The sun's up. <laughs> Uh-oh, what'd they do now? We got to hide. We got to hide. God's coming. Ooh. You ever get that feeling? God's coming. They didn't know what he was going to do. They didn't know what he was going to do. What, what did he do? Get out. Get out. He cast them out of his presence. Get out. And I can just, the old pictures, and I have a Bible at home, a kid's Bible. It's the old, old Bible with nice pictures, and it's got some really good ones. And it shows them leaving, and it shows them with the skins on it. And they're going like this, and they're, they're hiding their eyes and their face. couldn't stand in the presence of God anymore. And won't sin do that to us? We just can't stand in the presence of God. It's eating us alive. Something inside we've offended. Something inside tells us we've done wrong. Something inside just isn't jiving with God anymore. God's withdrawing his presence. That's a terrible place to be. He did that with Adam and Eve. And he did it again with who? He did it with Saul, but he did it long before that with somebody else too. He did it not just with Adam and Eve. He did it with Cain, didn't he? In fact, it says specifically there that God drove Cain out from his presence. And Cain became a fugitive and a bag of, vagabond in the world. He was driven out from the presence of God. We say, but, but I haven't murdered somebody. Oh, but we need to remember the scripture. I'm sitting with a bunch of murderers. You're hearing a message from a murderer today. You killed somebody? No, we didn't actually kill somebody. But the Bible tells us that if you've broken the law in one point, you're what? Guilty of all. Men, you ever lust? You know, put your hand up. Because there's not a man in here that hasn't. 
he that looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. What are you guilty of? Come on, what are you guilty of? What are men, what are we guilty of? I'll include myself. It's an easy sin to commit. Adultery. You ever want something that belonged to somebody else? I saw a fancy Dodge truck the other day come past my house. It was beautiful. Beautiful. One of the nicest trucks I ever saw. And in my heart, I said, that is sweet. And I heard, Whoa, you know, that diesel coming out of there and just like something just, and I, you know, just puts hair on your chest. It does something to you. <laughs> It does something, and all of a sudden, you you know, you get that, or you're feeling that testosterone rush, and you say, I want one of them. That's nice. And then I hear the words, I coveted no man's silver, nor gold, nor apparel. And I said, oh, Paul, you are a lot better than me. Ever been guilty of something like that? Come on. Who in here has never been guilty of anything like that? Okay, then put your hand up because you're a liar. <laughs> yeah, you're bearing false witness about yourself. If you've broken the law in one point, guilty of all. Guilty of all. Does God have a right today to withdraw his presence from all of us? Yes, he does. And it's a sad, sad place to be. Okay, do you, here's a question though. How much do you desire God's presence? Would it go first on that list? 10 things I desire to be in the presence of God and to have his presence felt throughout my whole life. Wouldn't that be a great thing to put down as number one? Let's hear the words of David. Psalm 84. We're going to come back here. Psalm 84. Psalm 84. You know, isn't it ironic? I get a message on the presence of God and I struggle for an hour and a half to get into the presence of God to get anything on this message. <laughs> That's like, okay, Lord, joke's over. You know, then I think to myself, Lord, what did I do? Immediately. Because when you don't feel the presence of God, you always have to start soul searching and heart searching did i do something that i caused my problem with fellowship this morning or lord if i whatever i've done forgive me forgive me i want your presence here i need your presence and if any of you men would have gotten up here to preach today you would have begged for that too Amen. because this Amen. can be being up in front of people preaching a message can be a very lonely place when the presence of god isn't with you and you think, what did I get myself into? But when God's here with you, you can do anything, can't you? Amen. Amen. That's, that's the power of God. Psalm chapter 84. How much do you desire to be in the presence of God? How much do you desire to be in church? Come on. Amen. Come on. Let's just be honest. Amen. Let's be honest. Check off this in your heart. You don't have to put your hands up. No hands. Is that on the top five? Where you want to be on Sunday? Is it? On Wednesday? Huh? Prayer meeting? Yeah, that's in the top five. I want to be there. I want to pray. Does God like prayer? He wants his people to pray. God like church. What does God say about people getting together in the name of the Lord? He's here, right? So let's all say, good morning, Lord. Come on. Good morning, Lord. I desire to be in your presence. How about just getting to church on time? How about just getting to church and being in your seat and being prepared to sing and being here on time? You desire to be in the presence of God. This is not something that man ordained. Man didn't make this up. This is a privilege, folks. 
And how many countries today people can't do this? And they would give their right arm to do this. And many of them had given their lives to try to do this. So don't tell me it's number one on your list. Because that list of five, it might not even be on there. Is this where we meet God? Then where do we belong? Give me a good reason why you don't belong here. Give me one. One. Come on. One. And I'll give you ten why you do. God meets with us here. Christians grow here. Great things happen in the church. God uses people mightily, and things go from here out into the world and can go to the ends of the world. You realize missionaries get called from the church? All of those missionaries we have in here, they sat in a church, they heard the preaching, they were faithful to God, and God said, because you're faithful, I will send you. To be called of God, to take his word to a lost and dying world is an unbelievable thing. When you think about it, God picked you. And there are Christians who say, I don't want to be picked. God delighted in you. God wanted you. You realize how powerful he is and how almighty he is. He picked you. You're his grace. His grace fell on you. His mercy fell on you. He desires to be with you. How much do you desire to be with him? David did. David said in Psalm 84, he said this. What a great verse. For a day in thy courts is better than what? A thousand. One day. One day in God's courts was better than a thousand. I had rather. He was a king. He was a king, wasn't he? I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. You know what David desired? House of the Lord. Come on in. Oh, sorry. Come on in. He rather kept the door. How do we feel about it? I'll go if I feel like it. I'll go if my wife gets on me. I'll go if my kids. Uh, you know, I'll be a. I'll go for them. And some people just can't get out of bed. What's the Bible say about sleep? It's sweet to a laboring man. That's a great verse. When Justin first came into the family, right when I met, met Justin, we'd do stuff together. And he said, oh, man, I'm worn out, Kevin. I'd say, sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Yeah. How'd you sleep last night, Justin? I slept really good. That's because you worked. You labored. But the Bible tells us also, love not sleep. And I told you this before. Some of the, If it weren't for the scripture, I might be a slug. If it weren't for the scripture, I might not be that person that goes out every day to make a living for my family. I might not have done it. Because I'll tell you, there are times I get up, I think it's every day. 
Can I get an amen, right? <laughs> I say, I don't want to do this no more. I'm tired. I tell you, it's really bad on rainy days. And I hear the rain dripping in the gutter. And I say, oh, yeah, there's something about it. These covers feel so good. And I am so worn out. And I am so, and the Lord says, go ahead, leap in, call off. And I hear the verse. As a door turneth upon its hinges, so the sluggard turneth upon his bed. <laughs> Lord, why do I have to know the Bible? Why do I have to know the Bible? He that provideth not for his own is worse than an infidel. Keep sleeping, you infidel. <laughs> That's rotten, isn't it? But thank God, because it's those kind of verses that drag my carcass out of bed. And it's those kind of verses that get me down the hallway and get me to the shower and get me to shave. Amen, Bill? Get me to shave. We were joking on Wednesday, Bill and I, about shaving. And I'd like to throw that razor out all the time. I'd like to beat my alarm clock up. Baseball practice. Give me one alarm clock. Throw yours at mine. One day, maybe I'll be able to do that. But until then, I have people to tend to, and I have needs and mouths, as they say, to feed. And we need God, don't we? We need God. We need God. And every day anymore, I've learned, God, today is a day just like yesterday. We're going to take today just by itself. And I know this is a great way to live because the Lord said, take no thought for the morrow. We get up every day and we put our hand in God's. We say, if your presence is with me today, Lord, I can get through. Help me. Lead me, guide me, because I need your presence. And if his presence be not with us, woe is unto us. Now, this was a long introduction to chapter 33. <laughs> and I hope you enjoyed this introduction, because now let's just read what it's like to be out of the will of, the, of God and out of his presence. Let's go to Gen or Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33, turn there, take a little break and get a drink of water. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Sean, for the water. Exodus 33, what well, it says in verse 35 of 32, and the Lord plagued the people. He plagued them. Now, it didn't mean that he sent down fire and he consumed them. It didn't mean that he was dealing with them in a matter of killing them but he plagued the people and God will plague us. I'll tell you, he will plague us. And I should get a good amen out of this. He will plague us when we're not right with him. And I want to say that again. So everybody gets this. God will plague us when we're not right with him. And when we're out of his will, he will plague us. And thank God he does. That's the spirit of God beating us up. Get right with me. Get right with me. Get that thing out of your heart. Take care of that. He plagued them, didn't he? He plagued them. And the Lord said unto Moses, in verse 1 of chapter 33, and the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt. Who brought them up? You see the language here in verse 1? You and your people. Yep, God was really upset. Take them up, Moses, you and your people. Go. Unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Now you notice there, angel is not capitalized. It's an angel. It's going to be a substitute. Because God wasn't sure he wanted to be amongst them. He said, I'll get you there. I'll send an angel. They didn't want an angel. We don't want an angel, do we? We want God, don't we? They needed God, not an angel. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. For thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. 
And it's unfortunate. God wasn't going to go in the midst of them. Now, that didn't mean God had forsaken them. And that's the same thing with us. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. But don't you want God to be in the midst? What's in the midst of you? What's in the midst of you? Think about your body. What's right in the midst? Your heart. It's right in the middle of you. A little bit to the left, but it's right there. Right, Brianna? She's going to be the next medical professional in the church. Amen. It's the apex of the heart points down this way, right to the left, but it's just off the center. It's right in the midst. And God says, I won't be in the midst of you anymore. I'll tell you what, where do we want God to be sitting? Where do we want him to be sitting? Because the crown of that right there, the base of that heart right up there, we want God to be sitting right there, right there. We want God to be controlling that heart in the midst of us. He said, I won't go in the midst of you anymore. I won't do it. You're a stiff-necked people. It says, and when the people heard these evil tidings, what'd they do? They mourned. No man did put on him his ordinance, or, or ornaments, I'm sorry, his ornaments. For the Lord had said unto Moses, say unto the children of Israel, you are stiff-necked people, I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from off thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out of the unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Okay, now let's go down to verse number 14. Or let's go to 12. It says, And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. So here Moses begins to kind of argue with the Lord a little bit. He's like, Lord, if you don't go with us, if you don't help us, he said, please let me know who you're going to send then. Moses was desperate. In verse 13, now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Now look what Moses says. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? That's the thing. We want God to go with us and be in the midst of us at all times. But sin can take that that presence of God away and if we have things in our life right now that are separated we're going to be like this begging God got to go with us so shall we be separated I and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth and the Lord said unto Moses I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken for thou hast found grace in my sight and I know thee by name praise God you know, it's nice to be known. It's nice to know God, but it's even nicer to be known of God. He knows us by name. But praise the Lord. God knows us by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Moses is really getting in. And he says to God, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by. And I will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. 
and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Now, when I read this in the past, I often thought that God appeared to him right here. But this isn't what happens. God doesn't appear. He says, I'll do this. So the question is, when does God do it? And he does it in the next chapter. He does it in the next chapter, and he tells Moses, here's what he says, come on up. I want you to come on up. I told you I'd do this, and you'll find grace in my sight. Now, I know those Ten Commandments are broken, and I know you shattered them all. And I got to give you new ones. Moses, I'm still a little bit upset. I want you to hew them out of the rock yourself this time. I did all the work the first time. You do it. You cut them out, and you bring them up. And when you get up there, I'll meet with you. Didn't it take effort on Moses' part and belief? It was Moses getting himself and the people right. Because Moses even says, after the sin was committed with the golden calf, Moses talks about the people committing the sin. But as you read here, he's looking to find grace in God's sight. Because Moses realized that he's a sinner as well. And it's Moses who's trying to find this rightness with God. And this, this where he's separated to get back in and say, God, I need your help, and I need your mercy, and I need your favor, and I need your grace as much as these people do. So not only is this message being preached to you, it's being preached to me. And I have to try this armor on, don't I? And I have to wear this message. And I need to make sure that God is in my life and that the presence of God is always in me. Because truthfully speaking, if we spiritualize all this, you're the nation of Israel. And I would be the Moses that God said over you. And I'll tell you what God did. God showed Moses his feebleness. And God showed Moses his weakness. And it was Moses who, after chiding with God and arguing with God and trying to get all this back, that Moses realized he was just as responsible for what all that was happening as the people were. And I tell you, whatever happens in this church is not just your responsibility, but it's mine as well. And if your hearts aren't right with God today, that falls on me. And my true desire is that all of you would walk in faith and walk in the steps of the Lord. And if we gave you that checklist that you could say, I honestly, 100%, God is most important. I honestly, most 100% want to be in the presence of God at all times. Bible reading, very important. Prayer, very important. Witnessing, very important. Being faithful to church, very important. I now see it, Pastor. I see it. When I read the Word of God, lo, I come in the volume of the book, right? You desire God, and you'll desire to, Him to come to you through the volume of the book. Does He come to you in prayer? Does He meet with us here? And after Moses got this all right, and he saw the face of, or he saw the glory of God, not the face. God told him, you can't see my face. And he saw the glory of God. What happened to Moses? What happened to him? His face was whiter than any soap or anything could make it. Moses, what happened to you? Nothing. Why? Because, like, you're scary, freaky scary right now. Moses, have you looked in the mirror? No, what's going on? What happened to Moses? He got where? He got in the presence of God, didn't he? And what happened to his face? He didn't know it, but the people did. When you get in the presence of God, others will see it. So much with Moses, they said, hey, we can't take it. Put this over your face. And when you talk to us, talk to us with that over your face. You see, 
The presence of God is very, very important in our life. He will not leave us nor forsake us. But shouldn't we desire to be in his presence all the time? Let's close in prayer. Martino, will you close us? Here, if you would, just speak into this. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray for this day. Um, I, I thank you for the good message we just received, Lord. Uh, let us apply it to serve you in our daily lives, Lord. Uh, I pray for safe traveling mercies today, Lord. I pray for people at work or for next week at work, Lord. Um, I pray for uh, comfort uh, in the recent passing, Lord. Uh, keep them uh, in our thoughts and prayers, Lord. I, medically, keep everybody safe and healthy, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, remember the viewing today.